ASHS, to continue this week's lineup of Unity and Community Hand in Hand, we're glad all of you are here to join us to hear from some of our peers and teachers who've had experiences reaching out themselves. We'll start by hearing from Mrs. Nakamatsu, then Mr. Davey, who both have had life-changing experiences seeking help, and from Mr. Torrance, who will tell us three big reasons of why we should ask for assistance. After, we'll be joined by a few students here at our school. Hello, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Ms. Nakamatsu. I teach honors chemistry at Saratoga. I am honored to be one of the guest speakers for Speak Up for Change and to share my story with you. I wish we could be in person, but this will have to do for now. My story begins about five years ago when I became a mother for the first time. I had heard that becoming a mother was a joyful experience and people kept telling me it was the best time of their life. Enjoy every moment was something I heard a lot, but I wasn't enjoying every moment. I was miserable and felt like I was doing everything wrong. I kept thinking, what is wrong with me? The first few months of my son's life were pretty bleak. I cried almost daily, often about things that wouldn't normally upset me like not being able to find plastic cups or whether I wanted brown rice or white rice at Chipotle. Other moms seemed thrilled to be home with their child 24 seven. Why was I struggling so much? Thankfully, I got help. It was hard at first to admit I needed help. I'd always been a good problem solver, so why couldn't I solve this problem? One day when my son was about three months old, a friend came over and wouldn't leave until I called a program for struggling moms. While that program didn't work for me, the fact that someone had reached out to me gave me the courage to admit that I needed help. I ended up finding help through a support group called Adjusting to Motherhood. In this group, I realized I wasn't alone. I wasn't the only one who didn't enjoy being a new mom and was struggling with it. Just knowing that was helpful. Through the support group, I found friends to lean on. One of my challenges was having a husband who traveled a lot, so I was often left home alone with a newborn. It turned out I wasn't alone. I became good friends with other moms in this situation, and we leaned on each other a lot that first year. When one of our husbands was out of town, we'd schedule a play date or dinner together so we weren't alone. I wouldn't have met those people without that group. I also learned to be okay with imperfection. I like to say I'm a good enough mom. I will never be a perfect mom and that's okay. I also started therapy and taking medication to help regulate my emotions. Therapy was a safe place where I could discuss my challenges and anxieties that I had about raising my son without judgment, often self-imposed judgment, and feeling insecure. The support group was also a safe place for me and gave me comfort knowing I wasn't alone in my struggles. Almost five years later, I am forever grateful I sought out help. I am more patient with myself and I struggle as a mom, and I try not to compare myself to other moms. It's hard, especially when social media posts make it seem like other moms are perfect. I am still in contact with a couple of moms from the support group, and we still lean on each other when times are tough. Asking for help isn't easy, and it takes courage. But asking for help doesn't mean you are weak. In contrast, it only means you had the strength and courage to go outside your comfort zone. I could not be who I am today without having asked for help. If you are struggling, please know that you are not alone. And if you see a friend who's struggling, do what my friend did for me. Let them know you care and help them out. Thank you for listening. If I was able to help at least one person through this talk, I will be forever grateful. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mr. Davey. I teach in history and also in the media arts program for the last 28 years here at Saratoga High School. And um, I am here today to talk to you about reaching out for help. Um, for me, that was a really hard thing because when I grew up, I grew up in a family of a coach, a college coach, um, and he uh, kind of stressed that you need to do things yourself and uh, be a man, don't cry, um, tough it out. So that was the lessons I learned early in life. And um, I guess they served me well for a long time until uh, I absolutely needed help. And that was on January 24th, 2004. 
Um, I was at basketball practice with the team uh, and my wife had a cardiac arrest and went into a coma. And um, I came home, you know, set my kids up with the neighbors and went to the hospital uh, to check on her. And uh, the doctor still remembers him saying, when I asked him, you know, what's the prognosis here? He said, she is the least likely in the hospital to make it. So um, she fought <clears throat> for a really, <clears throat> excuse me, for a really long time. Um, and I was by her side 12 hours a day uh, while she was in the hospital. Um, and then you suddenly need help. Uh, you need help with your kids. You need help cooking. You need help teaching. Um, you know, you're worried about losing your house, um, you know, because your wife, um, she was, you know, she made more money than I did. Uh, so um, desperate need of help. And it was something really hard to ask for. Thankfully, in my case, uh, the teachers came to my aid, uh, collectively gave me sick days to make it through the rest of the year. Um, you know, subbed in my classes. Um, you know, I ended up teaching, you know, three fifths of the, my normal load and um, people, you know, my sister moved from Seattle to take care of my kids. You know, I didn't have to ask for help. It was still, you know, um, given to me. You know, people brought food to our house and I'm really lucky because, you know, in situations like we have right now with COVID, a lot of people aren't that lucky. They don't have the community to help them. And I don't know, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have made it through that if it hadn't been for our community. But I, you know, I needed more help than that too, because, you know, she was, Kathleen was, you know, my life partner. She was my true love. And, um, and three or four weeks in, I realized that you know, after several doctors told me that she was never going to come back. Um, you know, I didn't want to believe it. Um, you know, I wanted to keep fighting. That was another thing my dad taught me growing up. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we kept fighting, go to the hospital, stay with her till uh, they kicked me out at, at 11 o'clock, come home, you know, hug the kids, take them to school, do my teaching till noon and go back to the hospital. And that was kind of my life. You know, I come home for dinner, make dinner with the kids and go back to the hospital. Um, and it became really lonely, really depressing. And uh, I needed help emotionally. And that's something that I wasn't really ready to ask for. I, I needed to be in therapy. And it was the farthest thing from my mind uh, because it's just, it's not something you accept. So um, it got worse, it spiraled down. And I started looking for a way out. And the easiest way out, of course, is to uh, commit suicide. Um, and I, you know, looking back, how close I was and how uh, I didn't ask for help uh, is just stunning to me because I have, you know, family and community that was helping two kids who needed a father to help them go get to adulthood. Um, and uh, it's pretty selfish to even think about it. But uh, I was really hurting and I wasn't getting any emotional help. So uh, every night I'd pass by this pole on the way home and I really, you know, thought about running my car into the pole. And uh, after a particularly hard night, you know, when the doctor said, really, it's not gonna happen. Uh, I remember crying in the car on the way home wasn't supposed to do that, but I was. Uh, I didn't cry when the doctor told me, you know, she was the least likely to make it in the hospital. I don't, I just didn't come to me. Um, and I remember putting on the Blue October song that I listened to uh, in the hospital with her and listened to her before. And one night I got the car up to hundred miles an hour and head straight for the pole. Um, and, uh, you know, right before, I, thankfully, the image of my daughter's flashed in front of me and I braked and there's really long skid marks I saw later on. Um, and thankfully, the next day, I called a therapist. Um, it was almost too late. 
I guess, you know, if there's anything to learn from the story is that there's lots of people, humans want to help each other. And it's really hard to ask sometimes. And uh, the consequences could be tragic if you don't. And uh, I almost asked for help too late. And really, I only saw this therapist six times, but it was unbelievably helpful. And I can't urge you enough to reach out. Do you have teachers that want to help? You have parents that want to help. You have family that want to help. And you may be shaking your head, no, they don't. But the answer is yes, they do. I know, I've gone through the experience. So I urge you to reach out. You know, if you ever want to talk to me and you're, you know, feeling down, let me know. Um, uh, we have counselors on campus who do a fantastic job. And uh, Cassie's amazing resource that we have. We're privileged, you know, and uh, we, you have love. People love you here. So I urge you to reach out to them and um, go Falcons. All right, have a great rest of the year here and it's gonna get better, I promise you. Things are gonna turn around. This coming fall is gonna be better. We may have to wear wet masks to school but we'll be back to school uh, and things are gonna get better. So make it through this time, um, reach out for help when you need it and uh, take care. Hey everybody, I'm Mr. Torrens, and I am one of the assistant principals and uh, the leadership teacher. And I'm glad to be here to share just a few minutes with you regarding Speak Up for Change. So this is a drywall knife. This is a wire cutter. This is plumber's tape, real light and thin. These are kind of unique pieces or pieces of equipment or tools. Uh, they're a little bit strange and they all take some sort of expert knowledge to be able to build a home. Here at Saratoga High School, we're not talking about building homes, we're building young people. And when you're talking about building or working with young people, uh, we can't do it ourselves. We need to allow uh, experts to come into our lives to give us advice so we need to learn how to ask for that advice. And those experts uh, could be, but not necessarily teachers or administrators or the adults on campus. They're just people that come into our lives with unique knowledge and unique background or a special understanding that, that can help us. So I've got three pieces of advice I wanna share with you that I've lived by that have helped me. One, ask, there is no such thing as a dumb question. Number two, ask, let me help. And number three, ask, it's not extra baggage. Let me explain what those are. Number one, ask, it's no such thing as a dumb question. Sometimes you may think you're too embarrassed to ask for help because you're afraid it's gonna be viewed as a dumb question. Well, let me, see, let, let me tell you, some of the most famous teachers on this campus have asked some of the dumbest questions. For example, one teacher, no, I'm not gonna give you names, who had received a brand new computer uh, the, the previous day, the next day when the kids were just coming in, they got on the phone and they called our tech coordinator in a total panic. And they yelled into the phone, I can't find the on button. I can't find the on button, they kept repeating. Um, it's not really a dumb question because as the tech coordinator pointed out, that it was a new design of a computer and the on button had totally moved. It, it wasn't intuitive and it was, it was somewhat difficult to find uh, until they got used to it. So, uh, but maybe you've got questions about things like parallel parking or a question about Canvas and we're six months into the school year. Don't worry, you know, there's people around that you can talk to and ask questions of. Your guidance counselors and Cassie counselors are two great examples. To them, there's no such thing as a dumb question. In fact, they follow Colin Powell's motto that there's no such thing as a stupid question, only stupid answers. Love that. Number two, ask, let me help. Oftentimes we don't ask for help because we think so many other people need it more than me. Last fall, we all remember the fires that raged up in the Santa Cruz mountains. Well, one of our teachers, Mr. Ori, has a house that was in the direct path of the fire. 
he and his family had, had to evacuate like so many of our SHS staff had to, had to. Luckily, the fire didn't reach his home, but came so close to his home that ash had covered his home and his garage and his, all of his outdoor structures. The smoke was so heavy, it destroyed his furniture, fabric, things that were inside the home. Mr. Hor Mr. Ori was happy that they had escaped and that their home was spared. When so but on the other hand, he was sad because so many people had lost so much. Well, so it was kind of in this tricky balance. He, there was so much service that people could provide to so many needy people. On the other hand, he needed to return home to his, to his house and provide a, a safe environment for he and his family. So he kind of struggled with that. How, do I ask for help or not? And he did, finally. Uh, he posted a very simple and direct message on his social media page. Several family members, neighbors, and teachers showed up to help. Um, on the appointed day, we showed up, and Mr. Rector was messing around on the ladder. We had some laughs. Ms. Herzman and Mr. Ms. Ritchie were bosses with the brooms. Mr. Dwyer was, was, did a bang-up job on the, cleaning the windows. So for like two or three hours, uh, of service really helped bring our staff together during this terrible time, uh, thanks to a teacher who reluctantly asked for help. Number three, ask, it's not extra baggage. We live in a society where if you are willing to pay, you can get all sorts of help. You can have your groceries delivered to your front doorstep. You can hire someone to take your dog for a walk. And did you know you can even hire a pizza delivery guy to deliver a pizza in an airtight case in a hotel that's underwater in Florida? It's called the Jewels Under Sea Lodge. We pay for all sorts of crazy services. However, when it comes to asking for help that's often free, we decline it. A common reason we decline is that we don't want to burden someone with our problems. We don't want to add drama to our friends' lives. I can pay hundreds of dollars for a stranger to put on a scuba outfit to deliver a pizza, but I don't want to talk to my lifelong best friend about my F in U.S. history because I think it might be too much for him. Let me just turn this around and say, think of your brother, sister, or best friend. If they came to you with a question about someone they liked in class, or maybe should they apply to this particular college, the first thought in your mind would be, wow, thanks for coming and talking to me. It's not baggage. It's backup. It's backup because usually when someone comes to us for help, they usually know what to do when they, and they're looking for reassurance or backup when it's the right decision. Now, not always, but often. When I was a freshman in high school, after dinner one night, my parents took my brother and I, um, uh, told my brother and I that they were going to get a divorce after 21 years of marriage. Had trouble sleeping that night, Had didn't say anything to anyone at school the next day, and then after school I went to football practice. I kind of let it fester and bother me all day. Um, after practice, my best friend and I were walking back from the football field towards our locker room. He turns to me and says, Torrance, man, what's going on? You're, something's wrong. Well, this friend, that this best friend of mine, his parents, he had his own problems. His parents had already gotten a divorce, but were living together. Uh, his dad had just gotten uh, in trouble with the IRS for pay not paying his taxes. Uh, my buddy was on the verge of flunking ninth grade. How do you flunk ninth grade? But he was. Uh, he had been missing his two front teeth because of a fight he got into with another kid six months earlier. Who hit him with a baseball bat. So yeah, this kid had some drama and I wasn't about to add to that. So I brushed him off as I, and we kept walking. We got just to the front door of the locker room. He stopped, grabbed my arm. He says, okay. He says, dude, what's wrong? What is it? Tell me. I'll listen. That was all I needed to hear. As I stood there in my football pants, stinky shirt and holding my helmet, I unloaded my baggage. And my toothless buddy became my lifelong backup. 
So I'll end the way I'll, I began. We all need experts in our lives. Good luck to you as you seek that expert that, you, that can provide you support, whether it's something serious in life or something small. Remember, unity and community, hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you so much to the three teachers who were able to share their thoughts and experiences. We will now hear from Josephine Chow, who found help through friendship, Samika Agarwal, who found peace through art, and Wilson Fung, who found support through his church counselor. I was 13 when I first developed an eating disorder. I began each day by looking at my body in the mirror, but no matter how my body was portrayed, I was never sure if my perception of myself was reality or if it was just another lie that I was living in. As with many things, it becomes easy to repeat an action once it becomes embedded as a habit. I began to hide my breakfast, throw away my lunch, telling friends that I just wasn't hungry, to come home starving and fill the empty void I called my stomach at the dinner table. I simply wanted to fit in. As an Asian girl in a predominantly white middle school, I constantly felt out of place due to cultural barriers and a shy personality. I was consumed by insecurities and a desperate yearning to belong. I accredited this disconnect between desire and reality to my own faults and saw losing weight as a method to bettering myself as it was something I could easily control. I struggled with anorexia for six months and bulimia throughout most of freshman year. I lost myself to obsessing over what I was going to eat at each meal and despite my weight loss, I was not happy. I constantly feared that my new figure was all an illusion and that no matter my physical appearance, I would never belong. However, as high school began, I developed new friendships and slowly discovered self-appreciation through them. Little things like receiving words of advice and paragraphs of assurance helped me realize that despite my insecurities and self-hatred, there were people who cared about me and supported me, despite the fact that I had given up on myself. By surrounding myself with people who wanted the best for me, I found inspiration to pursue activities I enjoyed and consequently reestablished my identity with newfound confidence. I did not receive professional help, but I was well aware that my habits were far from healthy. The more I immersed myself within friendships, the more I felt that I could release my hold over food. I was slowly able to accept myself, but today it is a journey that is still unfinished. Though I am not as afraid of food anymore, I'm still plagued with occasional scrutinization over my physique. Yet I continue striving to put myself, my happiness, and my relationships over any social standards. My story may make recovery seem easy, but I do want to emphasize that struggling with an eating disorder can be so emotionally, mentally, and physically draining. I'm very grateful to have had compassionate friends who uplifted me during this chapter of my life and would like to offer you all a support system if needed. To anyone who is struggling with body dysmorphia, an eating disorder, or feels down and alone, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Samika and I'm a sophomore here at SHS. Even before quarantine, all of us have faced a lot of high school pressure and the pressure to do more and more and to not just please ourselves, but live up to the high societal standards that we carry around with us every day, knowing that everything we do affects our future is a heavy load to carry around. And on top of all that, we face the terror and the unknown of the COVID virus and the pandemic. Due to shelter in place, um, that started in March 2020, going to school, meeting and interacting with friends, playing sports and even learning in from teachers in person was all snatched away. I found myself cooped up in my family with my family in my house 24 7 and the situation was very terrifying and it led to stress and anxiety something that 
everyone deals with but each person deals with it in a different way and for me art is how I overcome it. Art is a beautiful way of self-expression and I prefer explaining what I like, believe in, by drawing and painting my sentiments and opinions. Many people meditate to relax and calm down and my meditation is my art. Um, as I experimented with different mediums over the course of my life, I even discovered profound ways I could use my art to transform my world, be it influence society or to translate narratives for social good. Art provides the ideal service to convey messages that a lot of times words simply cannot. In these interesting times, quarantine has given me the time to contemplate my art. How should I improve it? How can I, what can I do to help others through it? For example, with the art club and the green team, we've been painting the recycle bins at school to promote the importance of recycling. Um, even Miss Vannery, um, the art teacher, has taught and advised me on all my paintings, even though it's all virtual now. And I cannot thank her enough for how much I've grown as an artist. And even before quarantine, um, I volunteered at the Saratoga Retirement Community to help teach art classes and serve food. However, a lot of this in-person interactions have been shut down due to COVID. I started an organization called Say Smile due to the quarantine that has been put in place. Um, through Say Smile, volunteers connect with seniors for lively virtual conversations to organize events, as well as surprise seniors with handmade cards and masks. Say Smile has grown into a worldwide organization, and even we even have SHS students, volunteers, who help contribute to our impact. And it's amazing to see how together we lift the spirits of our seniors and even each other and the teen, adult, and elderly volunteers. I strongly believe that the youth who went through this experience will all come out more resilient, empathetic, and stronger than ever. And never will I take for granted seeing my friends in person and my health, others' health, and learning from my teachers in person and the importance of working together. During these trying times, I found art and community service to be my solace. And Really hope everyone finds something that they can um, help deal with their stress. So stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I cannot wait to be back in school. Most people would describe me to be very positive, outgoing, and pretty friendly. I've been this way from a young age. But late in middle school, this appearance of myself became a way for me to hide my true feelings. At this time, I didn't have a strong friend group most people had, and I spent most of my breaks and lunch wandering around campus doing homework in the library, or just sitting somewhere waiting for the bell to ring. I was rather lonely, and because of it, there didn't seem to be any place I fit in. I felt very alone, and life became a simple routine and devoid of much enjoyment. I had friends from band and church, but because I didn't hang out with them very often, I couldn't open up to them about my feelings. I didn't want to talk to people and burden them with my problems because I believed that they had more significant problems to worry about. Uh, I also did not want to worry anyone, and. So I continued to believe so until in eighth grade, I decided to sign up for my church's counselor youth mentorship. One of the counselors I knew well had asked me to think about it. And I thought after a while, I had nothing else to do. So I might as well do it. I got paired up with a newer counselor, Sam, whom I had never met before. and was so scared to me because he was 12 years older than me. After we met for the first time, we continued to meet every month or so. And I gradually became more comfortable around him. He always told me that if I ever wanted to talk about anything, to just call him or text him. I had never thought much of it because to me, he was just my counselor from church who I would meet occasionally. And then one day when I was feeling a bit more down and a bit bored, I finally mustered up the courage to reach out to him. That one call allowed me to become more vulnerable and I was able to talk through how I felt so alone at the time. And eventually that led to me being able to open up to other people. After our talk, he reassured me that people did care about me and that if I had problems to not just suppress them. Although he had his own problems to deal with, he said that I shouldn't get used to running from my problems as it was unhealthy mentally. I should just talk to him and other people in my life. Ever since then, I've continued to meet with him and we text very frequently. Because I knew he would be there for me, I was able to put myself out there and search for people to hang out with as well as become more of my positive self I, I used to be. He always reminded me that I shouldn't care what others think and to just be me. He's been there for me for three to four years now and supports me in whatever I do encourage, and encourages me to be the best person I can be. The point I would like you guys to take away from my story is that your problems are not too insignificant for someone else to care about and don't be afraid to talk or reach out to someone else. Asking for help does not hurt you in any way. Rather, not asking for help is more detrimental. If it's anyone close to you, they'll be happy to help you out whenever you can, and we'll take the time to listen. 
Carrying your burdens alone is difficult and tiring. If you ever need help with anything, need advice, or just want to talk, please don't hesitate to message me or anyone that's close to you. Thank you to all the speakers and everyone who joined us tonight, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at the Zoom webinar with Speaker Dean Willems.